Thank you. 75 years ago, last month, the few went up to defend our skies. The Battle of Britain was fought by men like Tony Pickering and Ken Wilkinson, then aged just 20 and 22. Despite their youth, they were not overawed. Indeed, Kenner said, we were cocky, stupidly cocky, if you like. We just didn't envisage defeat. We knew we were going to win. Against immense odds, the heroes of fighter command lifted the threat of invasion and showed Hitler that we would never surrender. 75 years on, I am delighted that Flying Officer Ken Wilkinson and Squadron Leader Tony Pickering are here today so that we can pay tribute to them and all those who fought so bravely. Thank you. Ken and Tony weren't just defending Britain. They were fighting against fascism, fighting for the values that we hold dear, freedom, the rule of law, the right to choose our government. And that's what our servicemen and women are doing around the world today supporting democratic governments in Iraq and Afghanistan, in Ukraine and Nigeria, in Pakistan and in Mali. In fact, let me tell you that today, we have some 4,000 servicemen and women serving on 21 operations around the world, twice as many as five years ago. And that's in addition to the 9,000 servicemen and women stationed abroad from the Falklands to Brunei, from Cyprus to Kenya, keeping us safe 24-7, often out of sight, but never out of mind. To those who last week questioned the relevance and power of our armed forces, let me tell you that only the United States is doing more around the world. And here at home, our pilots, our sailors, our bomb disposal teams are protecting our territorial waters and airspace and assisting counterterrorism operations. I am, I am fortunate to have a strong team of defence ministers here today. Philip Dunn, Penny Mordaunt, Freddie Howe, Mark Lancaster and Julian Brazier, ably supported by Chris Hopkins, Graham Evans and Oliver Colville. But keeping Britain safe doesn't depend on defence ministers. It depends on the almost 2,000 men and women who wear the Queen's uniform, and every single one of them deserves our heartfelt gratitude. <laughs> as well as our gratitude, they also deserve our support. We are making sure that the unsung heroes, our service families, can enjoy the stability and security of owning their own home. As of today, our Forces Help to Buy scheme has enabled 5,000 service men and women to buy their own home. I want to double that to 10,000 Homes for Heroes in the next 12 months. And we'll do more to help those posted overseas. The major mobile phone companies have now agreed to allow family members to put their contracts on hold while they're away. We're working to make it 
easier to access financial services and get that credit rating when you return. We will strengthen the covenant to give our veterans a better chance of getting a job. We will do our duty to them as they do their duty for us. Conference. Last year, I warned that this was no time to drop our guard or to lower defense spending. The general election showed that the British people want a government that delivers both national security and economic security. And that is what we are delivering. In the first conservative budget for 19 years, our chancellor put defense First, already the fifth biggest in the world, our defense spending will now increase every year. And we will meet that NATO commitment to spend 2% of GDP on defense, not just this year and next year, but every year of this decade. <laughs> and we can only afford to do that because we have a strong economy. Now, just because my department's budget is rising again, let me tell you that there will be no let-up in getting better value for every pound we spend in defense. Because from now on, every pound saved in efficiency can be reinvested in the front line and not handed back to the Treasury. Every service is committing now to greater efficiency. Let me give you some examples. The Army will be cutting the costs of leasing and hiring its vehicles by 10%. The Royal Navy will in future have 300 fewer officers, but 600 more sailors to man our ships and submarines. The Royal Air Force will save over 250 million through better use of our Voyager air tanker fleet. Those efficiency savings mean that we are now able to spend more on cyber, on unmanned aircraft, on the latest technology, keeping ahead of our adversaries. Labour's approach couldn't be more different or more dangerous. They responded to their election defeat by electing a leader who would weaken our national security, who would scrap Trident, who would leave NATO, and who couldn't think of any circumstances in which he would actually use our armed forces. Let me tell you, this is no time for Britain to retreat from the world, to let terror triumph or to put our people in peril. So the first thing we do today is to renew our resolve to face down the growing threats to our security and our prosperity. ISIL is the most serious threat to Britain in a generation. Murdering British hostages, British holidaymakers, and butchering innocent civilians. For over a year now, our pilots have flown day and night in the fight against ISIL. Our troops are training more Iraqi forces in infantry skills and encountering improvised explosives as they start to push ISIL back. ISIL's terror in Iraq and against us here in Britain is organized and directed from northern Syria. ISIL recognizes no borders and has to be taken on wherever it roots. So we shouldn't leave it to French, Australian or American aircraft to keep our own streets safe. Nor should anybody, including Russia, prop up the tyrant rather than tackle terror. Syria deserves to be free of both ISIL and Assad. <laughs> the 
Nor should we forget that in Europe, Russia is changing international borders by force, something we've not seen since the end of World War II. 7,000 people have died as Ukraine fights for its sovereignty and freedom. In the face of that aggression, we have to show that our collective resolve is stronger than ever. While the peoples of Eastern Europe are looking to us to protect their freedom, so hard won from communism, Labour has now elected a leader who would abandon them. Let me tell you, we will strengthen NATO, not question it. In Africa, we are committing more troops to help keep the peace, to address poor governance that spawns terrorism and that drives migration, tackling the causes of those desperate scenes in the Mediterranean where our Royal Navy is, serving, is saving thousands of lives. Second, we will make sure that we are ready for any future threats. This year's Strategic Defense Review is weighing the threats we will face in the coming decade and beyond. It will decide the capabilities our armed forces need to respond to those threats. And when it reports at the end of this year, it will set out our aims to ensure that our armed forces and security services can keep this country safe at home and can keep our interests secure abroad. That we can stand up for our values that we can confront aggression where we find it, and that we can help our allies and friends across the world. Third, we are investing some 160 billion pounds so that our world-class armed forces can have the world-class equipment that they need. New submarines, new fighter aircraft, new armored vehicles, and early in 2017, the first of our new aircraft carriers, the most powerful ships the Royal Navy has ever had, will arrive in Portsmouth, where it will be welcomed by both that city's conservative MPs. The biggest decision the biggest investment decision that this parliament has to take is to replace the ballistic missile submarines that carry our nuclear deterrent. For 46 years now, our deterrent has been deployed every hour of every day. Anyone thinking of ending this unbroken patrol has to be absolutely certain that no nuclear threat would ever emerge against our country in the 2030s, the 2040s, and the 2050s. I'm not prepared to gamble with our national security, so I will be asking MPs of all parties to put national security first and to support the building of four new ballistic missile submarines in this parliament and we will not let any coalition of left-wing Labour or the SNP stop us. <laughs> Conference, the first duty of government is to keep our country and our people safe. As the world becomes a more dangerous place, be proud of a conservative government led by a prime minister and chancellor who have chosen to increase defense spending. Be proud that Britain is one of only four countries in the world building aircraft carriers and clearing its deficit at the same time. Be proud that Conservatives will keep our commitment to NATO, will stand up for our values, and will play our part 
in tackling aggression, terrorism, and instability around the world. But be prouder still of our armed forces who are doing whatever it takes to keep Britain safe. 75 years ago, Churchill paid tribute to the few. Today, let's also remember those nearly 200,000 servicemen and women serving so bravely who never let us down. This party, this government, won't let them down.